This conference will now be recorded. Okay, good morning again, brothers and sisters. Uh, this is um, Minister Jerry Spencer from Bank Street Memorial Baptist Church in Norfolk, Virginia. Good morning to you. Uh, welcome again, brothers and sisters, to the International Adult Bible Study Ministry. And welcome to another study of the Word of God. I'm just God's messenger. So let us give praise this morning to our God and Savior, Jesus the Christ. As his messenger, this is a message from the Lord Jesus the Christ. Jesus says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that whoever believes in him should have eternal life. And only in Christ Jesus, my friends, will you find rest for your souls. Our creator and redeemer came to offer you and me eternal life. And it comes only by faith in the Son of God, Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so this, my friends, in Christ Jesus, this is the promise of the Savior. So let us take a moment and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for blessing us to be here this day, to hear your word. I ask and pray, O oh Heavenly Father, that now the Holy Spirit will take full control of this Bible study ministry. I pray this, Father, in Jesus' holy name, amen. Okay, we are going to be having uh, three studies this week. This, this next three weeks, we will be studying from the Epistle to the Galatians. The Epistle to the Galatians. And today our study will be coming from Galatians chapter 3, verses 18 through 19, 9, uh, 29 rather, 18 through 29. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, the mission of the International Adult Bible Study Ministry is to lead the souls of men and women to Jesus Christ through the teaching of his word. And so we pray, Father, that, Lord, your word may go out and may not return to you void. Our key verse comes from Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, and it reads, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is a, uh, this first study, brothers and sisters, is a very interesting study. <clears throat> and it helps us get a, a foothold of what the next two weeks are gonna look like. And so we go straight to our historical background. We know that the Galatian Christians, uh, they were a community of believers in the region of Galatia that's uh, located in the Southern region of what is called Turkey today. Paul had written this epistle to the churches after his first missionary journey. But it was before the apostolic council gathering that was spoken of in Acts chapter 15. This council is important to our next three studies in Galatians. And for the reason for that council, brothers and sisters, was that it had to do with the issue of Judaizers, the Judaizers who were uh, Messianic Jews but they wanted to force upon the Gentile believers a certain, certain ceremonial laws, and in particular, circumcision. Now, Paul's first missionary journey took him to Galatia. It also took him to Aconia, Lystra, Derbe, and to other believers in that region. The epistle to the Galatians became the first of Paul's writing of the New Testament, which was written around AD 48 or 49. And that was about uh, less than 20 years after the crucifixion and ascension of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. And so this means that Paul's conversion may have been around AD 33. Now, not long after Paul returned from his missionary journey, uh, he returned to Antioch, he discovered that the Judaizers from Jerusalem, according to Acts 15:1 visited the city and the churches, according to Galatians chapter 2, verse 12. Now, while he was engaging in their controversy concerning circumcision and the ceremonial laws, news had come to Paul 
that similar teachings had infiltrated the very churches that he had planted in Galatia. Uh, and so the purpose of Paul's writing to the churches in Galatia was to refute the Judaizers' teaching that Gentile believers must obey the Jewish law in order to be saved and to call Christians or true believers in Christ to faith and freedom, which is in Christ only. And so what you see, friends, is that the Judaizers accepted the Messiahship of Jesus, but they wanted to add Old Testament requirements to the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. They wanted the Gentiles, non-Jews, us, to also accept Jewish obedience, and in particular, circumcision for the men, as symbolizing the keeping of the ethical and ceremonial laws. And we find these in, <clears throat> we find this in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, in Galatians uh, chapter 3, verse 2 and 10, um, Galatians chapter 4, verse 10 and 21, and in Galatians 5, chapter 2, uh, chapter 2, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 5, verse 2. But for Paul, their message was perverting the true gospel message. As he puts it, they were trying to present a different gospel other than the one we preached to you. These were Paul's words. So what we find in them is that the most pressing controversy in the early church was the relationship of new believers, Gentiles, if you will, to the Jewish law. Now, this was a problem because the Jew, the Gentiles, the Gentile converts and the young churches that Paul had formed or founded in his first missionary journey. But the scriptures are clear. The Mosaic law was given specifically to the Israelites according to Exodus chapter 3, verse 10, chapter 4, verse 29, chapter 9, verse 1, chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, and then Exodus chapter 20. This includes the ethical and ceremonial laws, my friends. So a controversy would be addressed at the council in Jerusalem, uh, according to Acts chapter 15. And so what we see is that hearing how the Judaizers were attacking the gospel, Paul was moved to write the letter to the Galatian church to set the record straight as to his credentials as an apostle, first of all, that he was a true apostle of the Lord and his authority or his call to preach the gospel. Now, brothers and sisters, Paul makes it clear. He makes a few things very clear as he begins to write this epistle. One, that he was an apostle, but his ap apostolic position was not through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Acts chapter 9, verse 15 describes how the Lord had already chosen Paul, telling Ananias to do what? Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. And two, that this Jesus whom he speaks of came to give his life for our sins and deliverer, and he was to be the deliverer of the whole world in terms of those who would believe in him from this present evil age and from the wrath that is to come upon this earth. The Judaizers must have been successful in causing some Gentiles to fall into the trap of believing that they should be circumcised, or else Paul's letter would not have been so strong or urgent. In fact, brothers and sisters, Paul was taken aback at how easily some had fallen for this false teaching, <clears throat> saying this, I marvel that you are turning away so soon 
from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ, according to Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. And so some in the church were considering turning away from the gospel of faith and freedom and had embraced the Judaizers' doctrine. Paul called it a different gospel, which is not another. He makes it clear in his letter that first and foremost, he was not trying to please men, but God. In this epistle, Paul is both pouring out his heart, showing how he used to, or who he used to be, which was a Pharisee who went beyond his peers in keeping the law and being zealous for the traditions of his forefathers, as well as proving his conversion and calling to be an apostle to the Gentiles, according to Galatians chapter 1, verse 16. When the Lord Jesus had called him to be his servant while on the road to Damascus. Now, it may be, it may be that Paul could have chosen not to talk about his past life, but he feels compelled to do so in defense of the gospel that he was preaching. And so what you see, brothers and sisters, is that this was Paul's first missionary journey, which was important, which took him to Galatia, where he established a church there. And this was his earliest writing. And so the last thing that Paul wanted was for the true gospel to be perverted by those who wanted to have it both ways. In other words, for the Judaizers, it would be like having freedom in Christ, but yet preferring to remain in bondage to the law. So Paul finds himself explaining the difference between the futile efforts of being justified by the works of the law, which is not possible, according to Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, as opposed to justification by faith in Jesus Christ. Justification does not come by the works of the law. It comes only through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul makes it clear to the Galatian churches how trying to keep the law would gain nothing, nothing. The repentant sinner is made righteous or is made or is justified, which is the same as being made righteous through Jesus Christ alone. They are also what? They are also sanctified through Christ Jesus without the law. And they are glorified by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, again, brothers and sisters, without the law. None of these things can take place by keeping the law. These are the words that Paul is saying. None of these things that can take place by keeping the law. And this is important, brothers and sisters. This is important. No world religion can cleanse the sinner of his or her sins apart from Christ Jesus. No one religion can offer eternal life. Not one world religion can justify, sanctify, or glorify a sinful man or woman. For if this was possible, brothers and sisters, then Christ Jesus died in vain. Now, I want to say that again. No one religion can offer eternal life. Not one world religion can justify, sanctify, or glorify a sinful man or woman. And please, please don't miss this. Without these things taking place in the sinner's life, they shall never see heaven, nor the creator. They are still in their sins, brothers and sisters. Our Lord and Savior confirms this in John chapter 14, verse 6, when he said what? 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. But he goes on to say, no one, no one comes to the Father except through me. No other, no one other than Christ Jesus can justify or make righteous, sanctify or separate us for Christ, for God, or glorify us before God the Father by God's grace. No one other than Jesus Christ can justify, sanctify, or glorify a repentant sinner. And these things are necessary, brothers and sisters, for the sinner's deliverance or for our salvation, because deliverance and salvation means the same thing. And so this takes us to our biblical study for today. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 18, it says, For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. <clears throat> we now know the situation in Galatia. A false doctrine has infiltrated the churches, just as false doctrines and false religions are in the world and have even infiltrated churches today. Paul had laid out a proof of his authority as an apostle when he wrote this epistle. The gospel message had been preached and the proof of it, of its truth and power, evidenced by their faith, was witnessed by the outpouring of and being filled with the Holy Spirit without any requirements of the law, you see. It was the same experience Paul witnessed after preaching to Cornelius and his family. While Peter was still speaking these words, the scripture tells us, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. He's talking about those of the circumcision, those who came with Peter. They were astonished as many came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on Gentiles also. They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God after they believed the preaching of Peter. You can find it in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 46. And so Paul likens the quickness by which the churches turned to believing the Judaizers, some of them, the Judaizers' doctrine, to that of being charmed, it says, being bewitched, according to the scripture, being charmed. The same thing is happening in some churches and religions today, brothers and sisters. Many people today are being charmed into believing the preaching of another gospel, a false doctrine. Why? Because the pure gospel makes them feel uneasy. Paul warned Timothy that this was going to happen in later times, telling him that for the time will come, he says, the time will come when they will not listen to the sound doctrine, but having itching ears will heap up for themselves teachers after their own lusts, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. Some churches are teaching easy on the ears gospel. Prosperity gospel. But brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, this is not the gospel Jesus taught. It is another gospel. Just like Paul was saying about the Judaizers doctrine. It is another gospel. It is not the true gospel. The same thing is going on in the world today. 
people having itching ears, Paul says, that they will not listen to sound doctrine, Paul says. They will heap up for themselves teachers after their own lusts. Again, brothers and sisters, there are churches today that want to hear easy on the ears gospel. There are churches today that are preaching prosperity gospel. This gospel did not come from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. This gospel was not taught by Jesus' disciples. It is another gospel. It is a false gospel. What Paul is saying is that if the law could save a man, why did God send Jesus into the world? If the law could give life, then why did Jesus not only come, but die on the cross? Why? And why would our Lord say the words spoken in John chapter 8, verse 24, saying this, that if you would die, that he says that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he you will indeed die in your sins. Now, why would the Lord say that if the law could save an individual? Eternal life and forgiveness of sin can only come through faith in Christ Jesus and never by the law. Otherwise, Christ died in vain. The inheritance spoken of came because of the words spoken in um, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. And as Paul puts it, the gospel was preached to Abraham saying, in you all nations shall be blessed. Paul spoke of all who like Abraham, who simply believed the word of the Lord, are sons and daughters of Abraham. And we must keep in mind, brothers and sisters, that there is there was no law when Abraham believed. The law hadn't even been given at that time. And so verse 19a says, well, what was the purpose then? What purpose then does the law serve? Now, Paul's smart anticipating that the believers would respond regarding the promise, Paul asks the question first, you see, what purpose then does the law serve? If God's inheritance came through God's promise to Abraham, then why should people, and in particular the Jews, rely on the law for salvation? The word salvation, spoken of throughout the Old Testament, and New Testament means deliverance, deliverance. And in every instance, the, this deliverance or salvation is accomplished by one person and not a law. Israel's salvation comes not by the coming of the law, but by the coming of the Savior. The law, my friends, does nothing but um, what's the best word for this? Bondage. The law puts an individual in bondage. It does nothing. It does nothing to bring salvation or deliverance. The law does not bring freedom. In fact, Paul speaks of being under the law as being in bondage to the law according to Galatians chapter 2, verse 4, and chapter 5, verse 1. So what was the purpose of the law? In verses 19b and 20, it was added because of transgressions or sin, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. 
Now, a mediator does not mediate for only one, but God is one. What we need to know, first of all, is that just as the Apostle John had to give his credentials in light of the false teachings that had crept into the church in 1 John, so John had the same problem as Paul. Paul had written the letter to the Galatians to warn them of how easy it can be for someone to try to inject impure or false doctrine or a false religion into the true church. You can, this can happen. It happened in the first century churches and it is surely happening in today's churches, brothers and sisters. There's a, there's, a, there's a scripture that we should all understand. A little leaven leavens a whole lump. This comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, and Galatians chapter 5, verse 9. In other words, you let a little bit of false doctrine, a little bit of wickedness, if, you, if it remains in that church, it will permeate throughout that whole church. And so be assured, rest assured though, brothers and sisters, of this one thing, that the words of our Lord in John chapter 10, verse 27, are true. Listen to these words. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So Paul now answers the question about the purpose of the law, that the law was added because of sin. To be more specific, brothers and sisters, it was added to make the people aware of what sin was. In other words, the law was added that sin might take on the character of transgression and thereby alerting or awakening the consciousness of the awareness of sin and how the law intensified the awareness with the desire for redemption aroused in the sinner. In other words, the law has revealed to the person of their sin and how through the weakness of the body, they need someone to be able to save them. They need a deliverer, but the law couldn't do this. The law's purpose was to reveal to the individual that they were a sinner. That's all the law did. Now it does point, it does point the sinner to Christ. But the law awakened the conscience of the sinner to make them understand that what they were doing, according to what the law had said, was sin when they rebelled, for lack of a better word, against that law. And so the word transgression indicates a violation of a boundary. The boundary transgressed is the law which God gave Israel according to Romans chapter two, verse 23. So, so brothers and sisters, the law was added to reveal the nature and extent of human transgression or human sin. And as a result, people became conscious of their violation. According to Galatians chapter three, verse 20, chapter seven, verse 12 and 13. The world may have changed. The world may have changed, friends. With each generation seemingly becoming less and less obedient to God. But know this, every living soul that walks the earth still carries the sinful nature, the sin gene, and by nature is a sinner in need of salvation. And we know that that word salvation means deliverance. 
they are in need of deliverance. And only one person can deliver the sinner, and that is Jesus Christ. Some of these same people may continue to sin to the point of quieting the voice of the conscience that alerts them of their wrong. But until they accept Jesus Christ in their life, they are still guilty and in danger of God's wrath, which will come upon the earth. They are still dead in their sins, no matter, no matter their generation. No matter their generation. And they risk becoming eternally separated from the Creator. But Paul says that the law was added because of transgressions. It, uh, again, it alerted the, uh, uh, the individual of wrongdoing against God because it was God's law against a neighbor and against themselves. That's what the law did. It made them conscious of these things. It made them aware. Before the law, they did what they did, but there was no law to regulate. There was no law to say what you did was wrong. Now God has given them a law that says, if you do this, this is wrong. And so it alerted the individual of wrongdoing against God, against a neighbor, and against themselves. It was there until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And we know that seed is Christ. Now, in verse 21, it says, is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not, Paul says. For if there had been a law given which could, give, could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. So listen carefully, brothers and sisters. There is a parable our Lord spoke of which convicted the Pharisees of their evil intentions against them. We find it in Mark chapter 12. Our creator had made a promise to Abraham. And because he could not, he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself saying this, surely blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply you. And so when our creator gave the children of Israel the law at Mount Sinai, it was given to them as a teacher to make them aware that breaking the boundary of the law exposed their nature and the propensity to sin or transgress, even when they did not want to sin as we'll see in the next verses. The law had not, nothing to do with the promise to Abraham. When God made that promise to Abraham, the law didn't even exist. But in this verse, brothers and sisters, Paul says that the law is not contrary to the promises of God, for both came from a holy God. God's promises are sure. The law pointed to and prepared the people for the coming promise, the seed which was to come. The law showed the people that there was a need for a deliverer, that they needed deliverance. The law could not save them. The law could not cleanse them from their sins. The law could not forgive them. The law could not sanctify them. And so the law showed the people that there was a need for a savior because it showed their sinful nature. The law was not able to give life. That would come only through the seed of the promise. And we know who that seed is, Christ Jesus. The law could not justify, nor could it sanctify or glorify the sinner. Only Christ can do that. Only Christ can do that. And so in verses 22 and 23, Paul goes on to say, but the scripture has confirmed all under sin 
that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Afterwards be revealed, he says. And so what is the law or rather, what is the promise by faith in Jesus Christ? What is the promise? The promise is deliverance. The promise is salvation, forgiveness of sin, justification, sanctification, glorification to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. And so listen carefully, brothers and sisters to the words found in Acts chapter 15, verse 14. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles, and this is critical, to take of them a people for his name. Now, James is not just talking about Gentiles now. He is, I mean, Jews now, he is talking about Gentiles. He's talking about people like you and me. This is what this is what's going on at the Jerusalem Council. Jerusalem Council. This is what James is saying. James made this statement. Simon, he's talking about Simon Peter, has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles. He's talking about Peter's visit to Cornelius to take out of them a people for his name. Friends in Christ Jesus. When Paul mentions the scripture, he is going all the way back to Abraham and the Exodus. God's promise to Abraham was because of Abraham's faith and nothing else, nothing else. No law was in existence when Abraham believed God. His faith and promise and the promise pointed to someone whom God was send that those of the same faith as Abraham, you and I, would also be, who also believe in Jesus the Christ. So just as Abraham believed God, just as you believed Jesus Christ, just as I believed in Jesus Christ, our faith is that same faith that Abraham had when he believed God. So we are of the faith of Abraham because we all believe in that one and same God. And so I pray that many will understand the words spoken today, brothers and sisters. The children of Israel were given the law as a guard, which did two things. The law made them aware of their weaknesses and that they could not keep it. And it reinforced the need for someone to come whom they could believe would give them eternal life because the law couldn't do it. The law couldn't do it. The law could not do this. It only exposed transgressions. That's what the law did, which pierced the conscience and confirmed the need for someone greater. Someone who could do what the law could not do, for what the law, according to the scriptures, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Romans chapter eight, verses three and four. And verses, and verses uh, 24 and 25 of Galatians chapter three, verses 24 and 25 reads, therefore, therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified or made righteous by faith. By faith in who? By faith in Christ. 
But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. He's telling the Jews, he's telling the churches at Galatia that after faith has come in Christ Jesus, we are no longer under the law or the tutor. The law made them aware of what they were in need of, freedom from the bondage of sin. And as long as they were under the law, they were in bondage to the law. In contrast, those of the faith of Abraham will recognize that believing in the word, believing in Christ Jesus, the second person of the divine trinity, brought about the blessings of Abraham without the law and freedom from the law that would come later. Therefore, he says, those under the law, once they had believed on the one who could free them from the law, Jesus the Christ, they are free indeed. John chapter 8, verse 36. If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And there he says, and there was no longer no longer acquire a requirement to live under the law. No longer a requirement to live under the law. The, the, the Galatian believers were made free by believing in the Lord. The, and they were, they were sealed, if you will, by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So why would the Judaizers want to force the Gentiles to obey a law that they themselves could not keep? Could it have been that, that they have been envious because so many uh, Gentiles had believed on the Lord or that this was their God and, and that uh, not the Gentiles God? So some so-called Christian Jews or Judaizers, some of Paul's day, had no desire to depart totally from the law. But their doctrine did what? It watered down the true gospel of faith without the works of the law. You didn't need the law. Paul was trying to explain to the churches at Galatians that you can't have it both ways. You can't, you can't, uh, you can't have works of the law and faith without the law at the same time. It doesn't work. Jesus said that his blood was that was shed, his blood that was about to be shed, represented a new covenant. Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, and Mark chapter 14, verse 24. That only Jesus could come and fulfill all the requirements of the law found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, because no other man could. And so, brothers and sisters, if Christ has fulfilled the law, our faith in Christ is all that we need. Our faith in Christ is all that we need. And so, in verses 26 and 27 says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The believer in Christ, and especially Jewish believers, now have a new relationship with God and man. For the Jews, it was once their relationship of the law and God, now it is faith in Christ Jesus. For the Gentiles of that day, it was once their relationship with idol worship. Now it is faith in Christ alone. And so our final verses, verses 28 and 29 says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed 
and heirs according to the promise. Heirs according to the promise. And so what, what Paul is saying is that it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your ethnic ethnicity. It doesn't matter who you are. If you are a believer in Christ Jesus, you are all one in Christ Jesus. Doesn't matter your nationality. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. In other words, we believed just as Abraham believed. The millions and millions of people and different nationalities who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ are all one in Christ and are Abraham's seed. And so if you belong to Christ, brothers and sisters, then you are indeed Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise of God that God made to Abraham. And we are all one in Christ Jesus, whether we are Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, male or female, doesn't matter. If we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't matter who we are, we are all one in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word because we know that your word is truth. I pray, Heavenly Father, this day that, Lord, your seed, the word of God, might fall on good soil, may fall on someone's heart today, and that that word might germinate, that seed might germinate and grow, and that an individual might believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the Lord as their Savior. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. We ask and pray, Father, that your word may go forth, that it may not return to you void. In Jesus' holy name I pray, amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, have a blessed and wonderful day. Amen.